Okay, uh, looks like we are live. Um, welcome everyone to Crypto Defined. My name is Kathy Chu. I'm a former Wall Street Journal and USA Today reporter who now reports for a new nonpartisan journalism organization called TruthDAO. You can check out our website at truthdow.xyz. Follow us on Discord and Telegram to join the conversation. Today's guest is Mike Alfred. He's a well-known value investor who has founded two companies and sits on the board of a half dozen other companies. Mike is well-known in the crypto space, not only because he's an investor in crypto firms like Swan Bitcoin and Bitwise Asset Management, but because he was one of the prescient voices in the industry who predicted that BlockFi and Cel a Celsius Network would have major troubles. And he made these predictions a year before the companies actually collapsed. He has strong opinions on which companies are in trouble in the industry, which we'll get to. But first, a few quick words about some of the things we will be discussing in today's show. More than a half dozen crypto companies have collapsed in recent months from FTX and BlockFi to 3AC and Celsius. There's been a lot of soul searching in the industry and talk about how the warning signs were missed by investors, regulators, and the media. That's why it's important to ask these questions about the health of crypto companies. And although I'm aware that some people are worried that asking these questions will spread fear, doubt, and uncertainty, or FUD as the industry calls it, it's very important, I believe, to talk to people like Mike Alfred, who are knowledgeable about the industry and raise important concerns about the health of companies that investors are trusting billions of their dollars to. Maybe if more of these discussions were had a year ago, investors wouldn't have lost billions of dollars. That said, with many of these companies we're talking about today, I did reach out to them in advance to get statements about their health, and I'll share those as we discuss these companies. I'd also welcome any of these companies and their founders to come on the broadcast to discuss the health of their company themselves. Okay, let's get right to it. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. This is a very important topic, and I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Mike, uh, let's start with SBF's interviews yesterday and today about FTX, since that's what um, everyone's talking about, and it provides con some context about the environment today. SBF seemed to frame the situation as a bank run that got out of control and said that he thought the company was fine as late as November 5th. What did you think of these remarks that he made um, in yesterday's and today's interview? Um, I don't think SPF's as dumb as he wants you to believe or as, as asleep as he wants you to believe. I think he clearly knew that there were issues. He knew that you know they had sort of borrowed against the customer balances. He knew they had used too much leverage. He knew that the company had poor corporate governance, poor financial controls. It intentionally positioned itself in lightly regulated areas. Um, it had made several poor arbitrage trades, right? Like the, the entire legend of SBF started with this kimchi trade way back in like 2017 at Alameda, where he was kind of arbitraging the price of Bitcoin between the US and, and, and Japan and Korea. And, you know, like, I think that was the last real thing that SBF ever did in a sense. And he essentially leveraged the fame and fortune, tens of millions of dollars from that trade into more and more and more capital and more and more responsibility, even creating the exchange FTX in, in 2019. And so what happened over time here is actually a story of a toxic codependency between Alameda and FTX because FTX's entire illusion, right? The entire time was that it was this large, healthy, profitable exchange that attracts a lot of great traders who would want to trade there because it's one of the best places in the world to trade. But it turns out, in fact, that a lot of that volume, right? A lot of the uh, purported liquidity was coming from one party, SBF's own hedge fund. And so once they started stealing the money from the customers, um, you can't really chop off Alameda because if you chop off Alameda as an appendage, you reveal the fact that the entire time you were lying about the liquidity that FTX actually had. And so both FTX and Alameda really depended on each other. And I would say it was ultimately that codependency that, that brought it down. So when I, when I hear, and candidly, I didn't actually watch the uh, interview live. I have too many more important things to do than listen to somebody uh, go on and on and basically make their pitch. Because I assume 
all he's doing now is trying to position for any potential legal action, right? So he's not going to tell you anything in an interview now that's going to be that interesting. Um, so I skipped that. But in, in sort of reviewing some of the notes from other folks uh, afterwards, it's, it's very clear that he's positioning himself in a way that doesn't actually connect with the facts. And any intelligent person who watched what happened there, you know, the conclusions that they would draw are going to be very different than what he said. Okay. Now you have a lot of experience with startups in the crypto industry and just in general and the management of these companies in general sitting on half a dozen advisory boards and and boards. The question I have is even if FTX didn't have these massive withdrawals within a few days, which is how he's framing why the company went down. Um, wouldn't their lack of risk management have caught up to them eventually? I mean, they didn't have a board for the main operations. They didn't have a last list of bank accounts. And as far as I understand from the bankruptcy examiner, they didn't even have a list of their employees. So, um, you know, would they have, would this, all these practices have caught up to them eventually? Uh, or, you know, could he have hidden this indefinitely? I mean, it was a comedy of errors, right? And incompetency. I mean, the the John Jay, the the former Enron uh, liquidator who came in said it was like one of the worst things he's ever seen, essentially, right? And and they were like keeping uh, notes and spreadsheets and in the chats that were deleted. And I'm not even sure they're going to be able to claw back some of the funds that were withdrawn in the final weeks because it's not going to be clear what actually happened uh, based on the poor record keeping. Um, that happened there. So yeah, I mean, look, in the long run, something like this is always going to collapse. The question is always like, was it predictable exactly how it was going to collapse? And I would say usually not, right? So like, it was possible to know that there were issues there. And I think, you know, CZ suspected that there were issues. CZ, the, the founder of Binance, suspected that there were issues. I don't think he understood the extent of the issues there until he pressed the button, essentially, by by saying he was going to sell those 500 million of FTT tokens. That was sort of the ignition switch. And then he had this, oh shit moment where he saw the light of the train coming through the tunnel. And he said, wow, this is going to obliterate some large percentage of the entire crypto market and may actually not just take down one or two other dominoes like BlockFi, but it might actually come back to us eventually. And so there's like a limit to how big you want to be right in this space. Like finance is 50% of the spot volumes and they just took over uh, FTX's futures volume. So there's some maybe rational reason why you'd want to attack your competitor. But if you become 60 or 80% of the entire industry, then then you are now a systemic risk. And you've made yourself the, the main storyline and the main character. And it's sort of inevitable that you'll be the biggest target uh, in the future. And so I think there was that moment of his recognition that, hey, this entire industry is a self-referential Ponzi scheme. This entire industry has all these codependencies and all these counterparty relationships and they're all intermingled. And there's almost no connectivity, by the way, to the traditional financial industry, right? Or the traditional financial markets. You know, Goldman Sachs hasn't extended a $3 billion loan to FTX or, or uh, CZ or crypto.com or Nexo, right? And so like, oh, this is all happening in this self-contained bubble of people who are all acting in inappropriate ways because they all exist outside of the traditional regulatory framework. They don't actually have any laws that prevent them from, from essentially stealing customer capital. I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed by that. They're going to assume because their sensibility, right? Their ethical frameworks say that you shouldn't be able to do what SBF or CZ or the BlockFi founders did, but it turns out there may not be any laws against it because again, these companies intentionally choose to operate out of that, outside of that traditional regulatory framework. All right. Now I want to talk about Binance um, in a little bit, but um, uh, first you predicted the meltdowns of Celsius and BlockFi. Um, and before we get into the signs of what you saw with these companies a year ago that was troublesome, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think about your responsibility in putting out information that could save investors from losing their money versus not creating undue panic if those suggestions cause people to withdraw their money. I think you've addressed this a bit on Twitter. And um, I think this is an important issue. I mentioned a few words in the beginning because I know there will be criticism about, you know, why are we talking about companies that haven't failed? Are we creating panic? So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. How do you balance that responsibility? You're very, you're an influencer on Twitter. You have, uh, I forget, 190,000 
followers, Mike? How do you balance this responsibility? Yeah, so it's not quite that many followers. And a year and a half ago, it was 5,000 followers. Um, so, and I don't think of myself as an influencer. I'm just an investor who happens to have insight and knowledge into situations that, you know, the vast majority of people just aren't capable of analyzing, right? If they could have analyzed BlockFi or Celsius properly a year and a half ago, they never would have uh, put money on those platforms. And I, of course, never did and advised everybody I knew not to touch uh, either of those platforms. So look, it's me becoming a more visible person on Twitter is something that happened organically. It's not something that I was particularly looking for. Um, I am starting a new fund, but that fund's only going to have a single uh, outside investor. It's literally just that person and, and my money. So I'm not marketing myself. I'm not looking for more investors. Um, I just realized that this is a space. It's, it's relatively nascent. There are all of these companies operating in it. They all market themselves as reliable, uh, you know, reputable. Uh, you know, offerings to the public. And in many cases, they're simply not, they're not, they're not institutional grade. Uh, they don't have financial controls internally. They don't have good risk management internally. And so it feels a little bit like my duty that I've self-imposed in a sense, because there's no reason otherwise why I would do it. I don't short the tokens. I haven't made a single dollar directly from any of these calls. Um, so, you know, I do it on my own time and because I think it's in the betterment of the social Good and it's actually better for the space in a sense in the long run because the more of these shady, scammy, fraudulent operators are allowed to persist, uh, the worse it's going to be for folks coming in and, and people get uh, ruined. I mean, I've heard stories about people who've lost, uh, you know, 100% of their net worth in some of these platforms. Um, so when I hear that, I think, man, maybe I should have been more aggressive, right? I should have been more active in, in talking about them. Um, so, so I don't know, like you'd have to tell me what you think the responsibility is, but I think legally there's no responsibility. I don't have any responsibility to anyone other than myself. Um, but I do tend to want to help people. And so if I can uncover things about companies and share those things publicly in a way that helps people remove their capital and protect their family's futures, then, then I'll probably continue to do that. And I've seen some of the messages on your Twitter feed from people who actually were saved from uh, the Celsius collapse because they listened to your words. Um, and uh, I think you said happy to help, but that's, that's what you're trying to do here. Okay, so going to BlockFi and Celsius Network, what concerned you a year about, ago about these companies and made you think that they were at risk of collapse before anyone else was looking at them? And, um, you know, at, as you've mentioned very clearly on your Twitter feed, a lot of people are thinking about these companies collapsing this year, but it's a long problem in the making. It's not like it just suddenly happens, correct, Mike? Yeah, that's that's one of the big misconceptions. Um, by the time the media re reports on some of these things, these companies have been in trouble for 12 to 18 months. Um, a lot of the trouble in this space popped up because of the grayscale uh, Bitcoin trust arbitrage trade that started to break down in the spring of 2021, so almost 18 months ago. Now, and, and I, to go back further, I had a huge edge in understanding what was likely to happen at Celsius because I actually knew Alex Mashinsky in 2014, uh, well before the, the current crypto industry, most of the current participants were even active. Uh, he wasn't in crypto at the time. He was the CEO of a publicly traded wireless company called Novotel Wireless at the time. Uh, we were in YPO together. It's a small group of maybe 60 or so CEOs. This was in San Diego. I used to live there. Um, and so we, we weren't in the same forum, but I ran into him at a restaurant. He knew who I was from, from YPO. And he came up to me in 2014. This was in the summer. And he said, hey, Mike, um, you know, I, I bought $3 million of Qualcomm call options. Like, I really think you should take a look at the stock. I know you're kind of a stock guy, right? Because even then I was spent a lot of time talking about equities. Um, and a lot of CEOs don't spend a lot of time on anything other than their own industry, but I've always been more interested in other industries beyond just the ones that I, I work in and run companies in. And so I did, I did watch the stock. I never was tempted to trade it. I thought it was odd that the CEO of a publicly traded wireless company would recommend buying call options on a related public company that happened to be down the street uh, in terms of it was like their offices were like a couple miles apart in like Sereno Valley and and uh, right, they're, they're both in Cerno Valley, like near, near Mira Mesa. And so um, I just thought, found that very odd. The stock ended up going down the rest of the year. So if he held those call options, uh, you know, he lost a lot of money on them. But it left me with this weird impression of here's a guy who purportedly has created all these technologies, but he's trading call options like a fiend and doesn't seem to be very good at it. So then he pops up again in 2019. 
Um, and I think we're in NASDAQ. Uh, we were at the NASDAQ trade talks with Jill Malandrino and he and I are on stage together. I'm sitting right next to him and he goes on and on. We have like 30 minutes on stage and he uses like 27 minutes. And the other guy and I get like a minute and a half each because he likes to hog the mic. He doesn't let anyone else get in a word in. He's kind of a blowhard, goes on and on and on. Doesn't, doesn't let anyone else interject, even when it's supposed to be a balanced uh, conversation. And it, well, I left that uh, perspective with the perspective that this guy, not only, you know, was he kind of rude and stuff on stage, but like, what is he doing in crypto at all? It, he had nothing in his background, nothing that I knew about him previously would lead me to believe that he would be interested in this space other than as a money grab. So then I followed the company a little bit. I noticed that they got into some of the same trades as some of these other firms. I also heard from a friend of mine who had to fire them um, from multiple custodians. Um, so that was, again, insight that was not publicly available, but I was aware of. Um, then you started to look at the trading behavior from Alex's own accounts and the transfer behaviors, behavior around the sell token. The sell token was also a red flag uh, because the, they were using the token to basically bolster the balance sheet. The mining business was a huge red flag for me. I'm on the board of a publicly traded Bitcoin miner. We went public in November of last year. We were the last miner that could go public through a traditional IPO because the window shut down. And then they put out something this spring saying they, they had put out an S1 and they were going to go public. So the insiders at Sully, the, the Celsius Celsian people on Twitter were cheering and going, look at this, this is great. And I was like, holy shit, this company's actually going to collapse because they're either dumb and they don't realize that the IPO window is completely closed or they're so desperate for liquidity that they're trying a Hail Mary in an environment where JP Morgan wouldn't even take the best run Bitcoin miner in the world public. And of course, Celsius was not the best run uh, Bitcoin miner. They were literally speculating on a market that they barely understood. So look, it, there was just a chain of things. They hired a 23-year-old woman to run a $300 million loan book, right? The, there was associations with, his, uh, with an Israeli entrepreneur who ended up getting arrested. The CFO got arrested in Israel. Um, they lost money in Stakehound and a number of other protocols in some cases where the developers lost the keys to those protocols. It was a succession. It was an absolute succession of problem after problem after problem. And I got the sense that Alex was literally just taking the customer deposits and gambling with a hedge fund with no risk management on the back end, and that was ultimately going to implode. And so I started to ring the bell right after Terra Luna, and I said, listen, this is going to be the next thing. This is going to be part of the contagion uh, following Terra Luna. And it was one of the easiest uh, predictions that you could make, given the amount of knowledge that I had about the way that the company had behaved. And again, my knowledge of Alex going back almost eight years now. Did, did Alex reach out to you concerned when you rang the bell and, and, and asked you not to speak up since he, just, he didn't know you? He discovered my tweets like maybe a week or two before it collapsed. And he yelled at me a little bit. He, he requested I take down my background photo because my background photo on Twitter for a couple of years was me and him and the other uh, executive on stage at NASDAQ uh, where he's talking and I'm sort of laughing. Right. And I enjoyed that picture. It was a fun, it was a fun moment. Um, this was before we knew for sure, right. That Alex was essentially, you know, scamming people. Um, and so I left it up and he saw it and he's, he was pissed that I was saying that Celsius might collapse. He says, you must take that photo down. And I basically said, no, I wouldn't. And then he, all of a sudden, I think he realized that coming at me was actually making him look worse. And so he blocked me with his account, Nuke's account and the corporate account within the same like one minute. Period. No, no. Because I clicked on his and then because uh, five minutes earlier, I was able to see all three of those accounts. And then a minute later, like I checked and the, all three had blocked simultaneously. So I don't know if he was personally running the Celsius account uh, at that time. That's very common, by the way, at startups is that the CEO actually has direct access to the to the Twitter account because these companies are really small and it's not marketing running it. It's like the CEO is actually going in there and posting stuff. And so I'm pretty sure uh, Twitter account at that time. So we did have a couple interactions. The one that got a lot of attention was when he was yelling at Mike Dudas, but Mike Dudas showed up like a day or two before it collapsed. This was after people like me had been going on for a month or two already, uh, but I was already blocked. So I could no longer interact with him at that point. Well, it goes to two points you made, um, Mike. One that you have this information that the average investor, the average person who's putting money in Celsius or in BlockFi don't have just by nature of your fi financial experience and also your personal dealings, uh, but also um, uh, from scanning your LinkedIn feed. I can't remember which post this was, but um, one of your one of your investors had talked about how it's important that um, people realize 
that some people investing in companies are investing in the people, the trustworthiness of the people, not necessarily just the technology, right? Mm-hmm. You need to be able to trust the people that you're investing in. And I think you chimed in there with a joke. Okay, so let's talk about some of the companies you've expressed concern about, um, uh, Mike, and why you think there are warning signs. Binance has played an interesting role in this FTX saga since withdrawals from FTX accelerated after CZ said he planned to unload the FTT that Binance held. The FTT is a token, the native um, FTX token. You tweeted this morning that FTX US and Binance US are functionally identical. Neither is truly independent and neither can fulfill its obligations when the mothership goes down. Act accordingly. Okay, talk to me a little bit. Why are you concerned about finance? So let's go back and one step down, just review why BlockFi and Celsius uh, and FTX and 3AC and Voyager and all these companies. Uh, collapse. So, so from the very top, right, structurally, the reason why a lot of these shenanigans even started in the first place is zero interest rates. Low rates incentivize all kind of poor behavior, uh, worse corporate governance, et cetera, right? Like even just the fundraising rounds at FTX very clearly got done with less diligence because low rates had sort of pushed everybody out on the risk curve. And you essentially have all these venture firms desperate uh, to get into the cap table. The second thing in crypto that started to come up in sort of 2020, but really got bad in 2021 is the amount of leverage uh, that people were using. Of course, there were exchanges offering 20, 50, 100x leverage at some point, even 10x or 20x leverage is too much leverage for a asset class with this much volatility. I mentioned poor co- corporate governance. That's a recurring theme here. Uh, light or no regulation is another huge theme. And then I would say across all of these firms, what happened is they were, because of their reach for yield, they did increasingly sloppy arbitrage trades that were capacity constrained. Meaning the trades like the GBTC trade kind of worked when there was only one or two people taking advantage of them. But when people were trying to shove hundreds of millions of dollars through that trade, those, those opportunities started to collapse and in fact went negative and trapped all of those firms in there. So when you look at the GBTC trade, right? That, that trapped 3AC, BlockFi Celsius, the Terra Luna trade, that trapped all of the firms in question in various different ways where they were all trying to capture yield because they had made promises to their counterparties, their shareholders, their lenders, right? Their customers in the BlockFi and Celsius uh, uh, construct that they couldn't fulfill. They couldn't deliver those interest rates unless they went out and got a higher yield. How do you get a 10% or a 12% or 15% yield in a sustainable way? It's, it's not that easy, particularly in an environment of zero rates. So, so you look around the industry and you say, well, who else, who else has similar characteristics? Well, BlockFi obviously was an obvious one because we knew once um, FTX collapsed that there was no way that BlockFi was going to be sustainable because their entire bailout was predicated on the solvency of FTX.us, which I knew immediately was going to go down with FTX if there was serious fraud. And so I I made that call the week of the acquisition announcement. I went on Bloomberg and I said, BlockFi will imminently file for bankruptcy. And then I believe the following week, Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg said, hey, we're reporting that they're likely to file bankruptcy. And of course, they filed on Monday of this week. But if you look beyond that, you know, crypto.com is another uh, example, another offshore, lightly regulated, completely unclear what their governance structure is, completely unclear that they hold the assets one-to-one. They've been caught transferring the assets, including Ethereum. Most of the exchanges volume of Ethereum to another unrelated party. Um, There's a lot of skepticism about why they would need to do that, right? They also are doing the same thing as FTX and, and sponsoring the World Cup and sponsoring the arena in LA to try to convince people that they're a serious exchange when in fact they operate in the same sort of shady way that, that FTX does. Um, the, so Binance is similar, right? Binance, we don't know who the board is. Uh, they used to have a CFO. That CFO resigned in June 2021, shortly after that GBTC arbitrage trade started to blow up. So at the same time that, that Three Arrows, BlockFi and Celsius we're all struggling because their gray, grayscale trade had flipped to a, to a discount. The, the CFO of Binance resigned shortly thereafter. And I don't believe that's a coincidence because it was apparently pretty abrupt. Um, there's been no announcement of any uh, future CFO. We don't know who the other uh, executives are necessarily. Like Binance doesn't make that very obvious. They, they've moved domiciles five or six times uh, since their founding. They currently have sort of no dom- domicile. So it's not clear how you would uh, hold them accountable. And so Again, we don't know for sure, 
because they're one of the most opaque large companies in the world. Like, again, you won't find companies valued at 50 or $100 billion that have never published an audited balance sheet where you can't figure out who's running it, where you don't even know where they're located. Um, but there are enough signs um, based on their pattern of behaviors that there's probable shenanigans going on because, again, they're not regulated in any reasonable way like a, a traditional brokerage firm. So, you know, there's no way to sort of verify that they're actually holding assets one to one. So l- there's a lot to unpack there. Let, let's go back a little bit. So in terms of their CFO who left, um, they do have a Binance uh, U.S. CFO. I believe it's Jasmine Lee that they hired. Um, I believe the last name is Lee, but they do have a Binance U.S. CFO. But you're saying they don't have an overall a CFO for the companies that they disclosed. And is there any sign, Mike, that they are um, basically doing, uh, basically uh, using uh, consumers' money in ways that they shouldn't, just as FTS, FTX was um, channeling it to Alameda, the deposits were going to Alameda. Is there any sign with finance that um, obviously they don't have uh, hedge funds a little different, but is there a sign that they are using the customer's money um, uh, in ways they shouldn't be? So, so first off, I just want to say that I don't think it matters who works at Binance US because I view Binance as a hundred percent controlled entity, uh, Binance US of Binance.com, just like FTX US was like they're separate in name only. Um, and you know that in part uh, because they, you know, when Brian Brooks was there, he was there for like three months. He was hired and with great fanfare that he was going to run this thing. And then he immediately clashed with the mothership because he wanted to actually follow U.S. regulation. Um, and he actually wanted to operate independently and, and that wasn't going to work. And so he lasted a very short time. Again, very unusual uh, set of circumstances there. Uh, so I would, I would flip it around on you and say it, it matters less to me whether I can prove today with certainty that they've done X, Y, or Z thing. What, what, what is more interesting to me is if you flip it around is show me any examples of them behaving like you would typically expect a regulated uh, above board counterparty to act. And I can't find any, right? And so that, that's the issue. It's not so much that I can point to one smoking gum. We know, we know that they've run into issues with uh, you know, providing services to Iranian nationals, including members of their national guard and potential terrorists. We know that because there's active uh, US investigations on that, right? And Reuters covered that uh, pretty well in a recent article. We know that they've created their own token, just like Celsius, Cell had the Cell token, right? Crypto.com has the Crow token. FTX has the FTT token. In almost all cases, they're used as sort of liquidity bolstering mechanisms for the exchange so that they can hide any uh, potential losses in the balance sheet, any denomination issues where customers have deposited one coin, but but behind the scenes, they're not holding that coin in the same denomination. It's the same, This is one of the things that destroyed Celsius, right? Celsius did a lot of stupid things. But one of the stupidest is taking Ethereum deposits from customers and then putting it into other shit coins, hoping to outperform Ethereum. And of course, Ethereum outperformed almost everything. And so even though the, they didn't actually lose the, the money necessarily, in a sense, they, they lost it in the form that was originally deposited, right? Because if somebody asked for Ethereum back, they didn't have enough Ethereum because they had denominated it in other coins um, that were worse. And so Binance has their BNB token. It's not clear that there's anything nefarious necessarily there, but again, that's something that you haven't seen Coinbase do, right? You haven't seen Kraken do, right? You haven't seen, right? Gemini doesn't have a token uh, for the exchange. Um, they also have a very large stable coin now that uh, BUSD that they seem to be pushing more and more people to use. Again, not necessarily anything outright nefarious there, uh, but these are all things that taken together you start to have to ask questions about what is this exchange trying to accomplish? Why can't they just file an audited uh, balance sheet, right? Why why can't they disclose who their executive team is? Like, why can't they easily provide proof that they're one-to-one? And why did it take all the way till now to offer to do a proof of reserves when other exchanges have been doing it for years? Um, So I was going to ask you about the proof of reserves because um, I did reach out to the company and ask them, um, for a response about the financial health of the company and and some of what you have discussed, Mike. The company didn't respond to the emails, but I do want to note that CZ has said publicly that the company is undergoing an audit to show its proof of 
reserves. He also tweeted uh, two days, three days ago that, quote, if you thought a fraudster is legit, you probably are already poor. But if you believe FUD all the time, you will also likely uh, be poor. So in other words, he's saying there's a lot of FUD going around about his company. Don't believe it. Um, there's no proof they're doing anything wrong. Anything you want to say to address that? I mean, I don't like, I, again, it's mostly obfuscation, right? And, and it's a smoke, it's a smoke screen. Like it doesn't, none of that actually adds any value to the discussion. The, the key point is that there is no audited balance sheet to date, despite the billions and billions of dollars of customer deposits, right? There is no domicile where they could be held accountable. And this speaks to the issues that have happened already with Three Arrows and FTX and, and some of these other firms where 3AC probably lied to their lenders multiple times about, about the state of their balance sheet. And those guys are surfing somewhere, right? They're surfing somewhere in the, in the Southeast corner of the world and enjoying their lives uh, because they had like a British Virgin Islands company and they had a Singapore entity and they used to operate in other domiciles. And so you can't pin them down um, because they don't want to be held accountable. And so the only legitimate reason, which the only reason that I can see why a hundred billion dollar company would operate that way is if the founder doesn't want to actually be held accountable. So I appreciate that he's now paying lip service to the idea that maybe he should do more of this stuff, but culturally it's clear that that's not ever been part of the way he operates. And so they will do their best to clean, clean it up and try to present it to the world. But again, a proof of reserves without a proof of all the liabilities, uh, without a real understanding of all of the flow of funds, um, we're just never going to get to the bottom of it. So we're going to end up with a tether situation where it's very clear that tether has participated in all kinds of things that are sort of, sort of not above board over the last five plus years. Uh, even today, there's still really no audited proof of where all the reserves are. And there's a lot of kind of bluffing, a lot of hiding, a lot of delaying, a lot of hemming and hawing. And as long as the tether doesn't lose the peg, maybe we, we won't find out whether or not it's fully backed. Um, but my suspicion is Binance is not that different from Tether. Um, and a lot of the obfuscation and a lot of the FUD this and FUD that is a simple distraction. If you, if you want it to go away, just, just actually behave like a $100 billion company. Put all your corporate governance stuff on your website. Tell us who your CFO is. Uh, release your financials and your balance sheet. Uh, don't tell us you're going to do it. Just do it. Right. And again, a lot of talk with Tether and Binance, but very little action. And no chance that you and CZ, you, you haven't met CZ, you can't tell him this. He no. won't answer your questions in person. I mean, I mean this, they is seem not, like, this is not personal. They seem like very all. reasonable requests, like put your executives on the website does not seem unreasonable. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and when BlockFi started to go down, one of the signals among many others that week, three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, that I knew for sure that the, something was really, really wrong and they were going to file was they removed, they scraped all the executive team profiles, like right, right, right away, like right after it looked like FTX was going to go down. Um, and so that was a key tell that something was wrong. Well, Binance did that years ago. Like Binance Wait, doesn't want you to- why, why is that a key tell? Because they don't want people contacting these- Because, because they don't, they want to sort of erase the management team from the company so that they don't take- too much blame. And there's obviously a security component to that. They don't want to like become a bigger target than they already are. But people who are feel good about their business and feel good that they're solvent and they'll be able to fulfill their obligations to their customers never do that. Never. And so it's, again, it's less about, because again, this is one of the most opaque large organizations in the world. And in fact, I don't think there's any organization this size from a market cap standpoint anywhere, anywhere globally that behaves this way. But it's less about because they're opaque, there's, it's less about pointing to very specific things, but more of, about pointing out this fact pattern of unusual behavior that seems to be obfuscating truths. Um, and it's not clear why they would do that other than because there's something that they don't want you to know specifically. Um, and we could speculate all day long about what those things are. I mean, I have ideas that seem to, to sort of align with that fact pattern, but I'm not saying that I know for sure. I don't have the smoking gun. There's no, there's no, there's no way to say for sure but as an investor, I would never, if somebody came to me and they said, should I buy a BNB token or should I deposit money at Binance? I'd say, I think the risk is extremely high, like blinking red high, even though I can't point to one thing, I can point to maybe 20 things that are problematic. At Celsius, I could point to a hundred, right? There were a hundred things and there were three or four facts that were literally smoking guns 
which in retrospect, it's shocking to me how few people were willing to listen. But this speaks to another point, which is that once people have made a decision to invest capital in these organizations, whether as equity investors or as customers, traders, hedge funds, et cetera, they tend to not want to hear anything that contradicts the decision that they've already made. And so there's a lot of anchoring bias, but there's a lot of bias around what people did recently. And so I, again, don't have any dog in this fight. I've never uh, invested in, in Binance. I don't own BNB. I'm not short BNB. I'm saying this just as an independent observer and saying, look, there's enough here that I would be gravely concerned if I had capital on these on these platforms. Okay, Let, let's talk about Tether because um, they're linked. And you mentioned if Tether um, were to depeg and collapse, you believe there's no major centralized crypto exchange in the world that would remain untouched. Um, the repercussions would be enormous. Take me through what could happen if Tether were to depeg and collapse. I mean, it has depegged um, a little bit uh, uh, off and on, right? But you're talking about a collapse of Tether. What would happen to all these centralized exchanges, crypt crypto exchanges? Well, I mean, the, starting at the, the outset, uh, you know, a bank run on on a stablecoin of this size would create a, a sort of a mass panic in the ecosystem. And so you'd have trading volume spiking across the board. You'd have people requesting to transfer money on and off of the exchange. So you have the possibility for smaller exchanges of just the sheer volume of requests for people to remove money from those entities as a sort of chain reaction of fear about the collapse of Tether and the declining price of the other tokens that are denominated in Tether, right? Like people would be trying to dump Tether, but they'll also be trying to dump any sort of risk token, like any token that's not actually pegged to the US dollar where they can get their money all the way back uh, to, to a stable currency. And so that pressure in terms of the withdrawal volume and the trading volume is going to be enough to take down the exchanges. Some of the exchanges will just like, you know, how Coinbase has the little thing that says, you know, trading degraded, it's a little yellow. Uh, button that comes up when trading volume goes up. Like you would have just operational issues, right? You'd have withdrawal requests that may exceed what's available in hot wallets. So you'll have multiple firms that might have to stop, um, you know, withdrawals for a period of time. And it may reveal, uh, again, with some of the more brittle uh, exchanges that they are actually operating not one-to-one -one from the beginning. And, and you know, that, that stress on the system is what would kind of reveal that. And that's what we've seen over and over again, you know, like the Terra Luna situation, it wasn't just about Terra Luna, it was all the other firms who were levered to Terra Luna who became functionally insolvent. If they weren't insolvent already, they became clearly insolvent to the point that their counterparties would no longer lend to them. Um, so predicting exactly how that would play out is hard, right? Because it, even, if, even if Tether had a bank run, um, it's not clear that it would go to zero, right? Like the same way Terra Luna did, because there are some hard reserves there, I, I believe that there's probably some real money there. And so it wouldn't necessarily make sense for it to go to zero. It, it's possible that it just goes to 50 cents or 60 cents or 70 cents or whatever the market actually believes is the real redeemable value relative to those reserves. But I think that would be enough to put pressure on a bunch of the large exchanges, including Binance. So again, the exact mechanism, how that would play out, I, I, I don't know. And again, I, I don't think it's more than maybe a 10% likelihood that Tether depeg significantly over the next three years. And, and obviously for those who don't know, Tether is important because it's seen as an anchor of the crypto system as a stable coin, right? So um, people use it uh, in, in many different ways, uh, including in a transitory manner when they are converting uh, money from, from dollars and going into the crypto system. Okay, so you, you've also said that um, this is the great financial crisis moment for crypto, Mike. Um, it feels almost exactly like 2008 in a traditional finance. You said the difference here is that there are no central banks, no buyers of last resort. The bottom for crypto is not just theoretically zero. I think you said this on November 16th. So what do you mean by that, that the bottom for crypto is not just theoretically zero? It's a very interesting point. Yeah. So so when you talk about the bottom of like the U.S. financial system in 2007 or 2008, like you always knew in the back of your mind it was going to be backstopped by the Fed. And the same thing happened in March 2020. In fact, a lot of people got this wrong. A lot of crypto people and tech people, I laugh about this now, they were yelling at me in March 2020 because in like March 19th, I was buying a ton of stocks because I knew that the Fed was likely to backstop the whole thing uh, because they weren't going to let COVID 
bring down the entire economy. And so you ha- when you when you have a banking system where you're the global reserve currency and you have your own bank that can essentially print new assets, buy assets, support the entire market. Uh, when you talk about zero outcomes, it's sort of theoretical because like, you know, there's no way the whole economy can go to zero when you control the money supply. The difference with crypto is it doesn't tie in to the, that traditional system at all. And there's essentially nobody uh, big enough to sustain the whole system if it starts to collapse upon itself. And so SPF tried to play that role, right? In the summer, right? As, as Terra Luna uh, collapsed and start a, started to predicate a bunch of collapses in some of these other en- entities like 3AC, Voyager, uh, you know, Celsius, et cetera. And so he came in and swooped in like a JP Morgan, central banker type of character, but he was, he was bluffing himself because he was literally just trying to protect the liquidation levels in his own firms. And he was probably technically insolvent at the time, but he was pretty good at poker and he convinced people that he was still solvent. And part of that was going on the offensive and trying to save other firms. The same thing sort of is happening now where CZ is saying he wants to put together a kind of fund to support the industry, but who else is left uh, in the crypto native ecosystem who's as large as CZ who could even play that role? And why do people believe so easily that that he's actually sincere about that or that he's even capable of playing that role? My, my view is there is no buyer of last resort. There is no central bank. There's no, technically there's no bottom. And so when we talk about crypto going to zero. And of course, a lot of non-crypto people believe the whole thing is a scam. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I don't think that we should delude ourselves into thinking there's necessarily a bottom um, to this market because all of these firms, all of these centralized firms could actually go to zero and there's nothing technically stopping that from happening like there is in the traditional market. Okay. And and, uh, Mike, um, uh, when you were talking about SBF, I think one of the questions that was asked of him is, why he did save uh, BlockFi and tried to prop up the industry. And he said he he had no other reason other than it wasn't because of FTT or anything else. He really did want to um, uh, basically save the industry from turmoil. And I just add that as a two cents so people watching can take what they will of it. That was uh, SBF's response. And I was remiss also, um, when we were talking about Tether, let let me just read Tether's response Tether didn't respond to our request for comment immediately, but Tether has said that they are stable, um, even though Alameda, uh, the hedge fund that FTX uh, related to SBF, um, was one of the largest issuers of USDT. And Tether has also said that Tether tokens are 100% backed by its reserves and the assets backing the reserves exceed the liabilities. So just wanted to mention that. Okay, so let's talk about crypto.com. And I have comment from them as well. You've encouraged people to pull their funds off crypto.com and said that crypto.com is likely insolvent right now. Um, The company told me that that crypto.com is finishing its second year in a row with more than 1 billion in revenue. Crypto.com has more than 70 million users worldwide. And the company said its balance sheet is strong and its cash flow positive. The CEO, Chris Marsalek, in a November 13th live live stream, says the company is doing an audit of its proof of reserves, which it said will take time. It's saying basically what CZ said. We're in the middle of auditing right now. And he also said that crypto.com is not like FTX and, quote, we are very conservative and we like our business to be simple. Um, and he, he mentioned that in a couple of months, all these guys are going to look really bad for throwing around allegations. And the CEO said, I'm looking forward to basically, you know, proving them wrong. So I mentioned the, these um, responses. What do you think? How do you think about what the CEO is saying versus what you're seeing of the company as a very um, skilled person in the finance and tech and crypto industry. How do you reconcile those? I mean, honestly, those talking points you just gave me, I'm more confident that something's wrong there. So responding to the types of things that I pointed out that are problematic with a revenue figure, revenue has nothing to do. You can, you can have 2 billion of revenue. You could have 500 million. Of revenue. It's completely irrelevant. The question is, are all the assets there? Then he said, our balance sheet is positive cash flow. Those are two different things. Balance sheet is just a snapshot of all the assets and liabilities. 
cash flow statement is is a totally different part of again i'm not clear i'm not even clear that any of these guys actually understand how to uh, run financials or analyze them the the basics of them because the talking points reveal like a lack of awareness i feel like if people like me and you know all of the stuff that's happened recently with ftx and if that never happened they would prefer to continue operating exactly the way that they always did where it's all about hype it's all about putting your name on the the, the world cup stadiums and on the lakers arena right and telling people how many customers you have but not about actually demonstrating that you have been a good steward of your customers assets like what, what why were they doing an audit in december the audit should have been done for for last year it should have been done within three three to four months of this year they should have audits for the last two or three years that they can provide to the market so this whole idea that now all of a sudden we're going to do audits and proof of reserves now when they didn't do it previously when they had that many customers and that many assets i'm just telling you huge red flags would never fly in the traditional uh f- financial markets it would never fly with traditional brokerages traditional exchanges and so you basically have people who are pretending that they have any real sophistication about how to do this and increasingly we're seeing over and over again that they don't and they keep blowing up um so again balance sheets don't cash flow uh revenue figures are irrelevant only thing i care about is whether they can prove that they're holding their customers assets one to one in the same denomination that they were deposited in um and i'm very confident based on the fact that he's mirroring everybody else who's failed previously and saying we will do X, Y, Z thing in the future that we've never done until you ask, but now we're going to do it. That that's always a, a, a sign that of weakness. I would also say that taking 82% or whatever it was, and it was over 80% of the, of all of the Ethereum balances on the exchange and sending them to another party and then blaming it on like some sort of tech issue was absolutely insane. Like, I don't know what's worse admitting that you were trying to dodge the proof of reserves or helping somebody else pass their proof of reserve so that they would help you later because it turns out you have a shortfall. Um, I don't know if the fact that they were sending billions of dollars of stable coins around to other exchanges is the biggest uh, rad flag necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm not sure which of these things is, is crazier, but if it was really a tech mistake, can you imagine the lack of internal controls at an exchange that sends the vast majority of their customer balances somewhere else? That would be like Fidelity saying, hey, I took all, we took all of our Google shares and all of our Amazon shares and just sent them to Schwab for three weeks for fun. And we had no idea. It was just a misclick. Somebody in the, the back office at Fidelity sent all of our Google shares to Schwab. Like literally if that happened in the traditional financial market, they'd be fined some huge amount. People would pull their accounts, right? Like they might even not be able to pass their regulatory authorities test in the future. The SEC would come in here. People just look at it for a day or two and say, huh, no big deal. Let me deposit more money in crypto.com. So again, like those talking points were not helpful at all. If anything, they led me to believe that there really are serious issues here and that the executive and management team have no idea what they're doing. Okay. And I did not ask them about those tech problems and that transfer. And I will ask them um, before we do the written recap. Also ask them, <laughs> ask them why they were sending billions of dollars of stablecoin to FTX and other exchanges, what the purpose of those transfers were. If they're supposed to be a self-contained custody and trading environment for their customers, why would they take their customer assets and send them somewhere else. You should ask okay. them that. So Mike, I have two more quick questions. So for investors, I mean, obviously you and others in the industry um, who have started companies and who know crypto extremely well, you can analyze these things and look at the, the red flags. For investors who can't, um, not everyone is following you on Twitter or following Corey or Francis Coppola or others. Um, uh, Caitlin Long, who are warning wh- warning about these possible disasters. So, what should investors kind of take away from this? These collapses that are going on. How do they make sense of what's going on? I guess. I think people need to be smarter about what risk they want to take when they sign up to do something in this industry, right? So, like. If you don't know the difference between a centralized entity and a decentralized protocol, like if you can't uh, explain that in a minute or two in a way that makes sense to you and other people who are listening, then you shouldn't be in this space at all. You should stick to index funds, right? You should stick to traditional bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Like this is not a place to play around with large amounts of your money if you don't understand some of these basics. If you don't understand why Bitcoin is probably the only asset that's decentralized enough and censorship resistant enough 
to hold for long periods of time, then again, if you, if you don't know that, then you probably should stay out of the industry because you're more likely than not to lose a large percentage of your money. But you also need to learn how to self custody. Um, if if you want to use custodians, stick to Fidelity and Schwab, right? Stick to stick to Vanguard. Uh, if you don't want to learn how to actually self custody these assets, then you probably shouldn't do it because that's one of the primary reasons why you would use a crypto asset. Uh, it's just one of the only assets in human history that you can own with no counterparty and no custodian. And you can transact entirely on your own just between you and the blockchain. So, you know, I've just at a very high level, I'd say those things. Like if you don't know the difference between Celsius and Bitcoin, uh, if you don't know the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, and you don't know anything about self-custody, if, if either of those three, like you're not very confident on, then I would stay out because there's not enough upside to justify losing 100% of your money in, in some of these things. Right. There's a lot of risk. Okay. And I guess my last question, despite this chaos in the crypto industry, I want to make clear that you still believe, I believe that Bitcoin specifically has a bright future. And one of your predictions is that Bitcoin's market cap will surpass the combined market caps of Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Meta one day. Correct? Yeah, Could yeah. You by talk to me by a little bit about that. By 2030 or 2035, I think. By is 2030, okay. Yeah, in that in that window, 2030 to 2035 is when I think that is likely to happen. You know, my my view is that firms like Apple, right, have sort of run out of market. Like Apple would need to take over like three or four adjacent market verticals completely to double their market cap from from over two trillion. Whereas Bitcoin could easily go to 10 trillion just by subsuming some portion of the uh, gold. Uh, demand to as a store of value, right? So the for the market size that Bitcoin can go after is just it's so much larger than that group of tech companies, and those tech companies are constrained not only by their current market caps but by the limitations of their core markets, which are largely saturated at this point. I'm not saying they're bad companies, but when they were trading in 2020 at 30 times, 40 times, or 50 times earnings, um, they weren't very attractive. And of course, we we've seen that in this year with Facebook, Amazon. Netflix, you know, Shopify, go down the list that they're all down 30 to 50 to in some cases, 80 or 90% um, like Carvana. So, you know, the tech, the tech space is going to be constrained by high rates. Bitcoin in the long run is just money. And so Bitcoin's competing for monetary value, not stock market equity value. And so I think rates could compress the sort of traditional technology equity market over the next 10 years. And actually in some ways could accelerate uh, Bitcoin adoption over time as people decide that they want to own hard money that can't be debased uh, so easily by by central banks uh, over time. So I, I'm still bullish on Bitcoin. I think with like sort of an 80% confidence that Bitcoin will find its bottom between now and sort of the end of June uh, 2023. So about seven months from now, that's kind of the window of time where I'm looking to add quite substantially to, to my holdings, both directly and through the fund um, that I'm starting. And so um, that's what I'm looking at. And so I would love to see a lot more of these um, bad actors get wiped out because I think that'll be fertile ground to kind of build the next uh, Bitcoin bull market. And in fact, I don't think the next Bitcoin bull market can start until the last bad actors are sort of swept off the floor and we can, again, rebuild and plant new roots, uh, you know, in a more healthy way, hopefully with less leverage and less poor governance and more regulation. Well, Mike, it's, this has been great to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. I really appreciate it. I think your words and your warnings are very valuable for people to consider. They have to make up their own minds, obviously, but I think um, voices like yours are very important in the industry. And as I tweeted, uh, maybe if people had paid attention, more attention to some of these warnings, investors could have saved some billions of dollars um, you know, when these companies collapse. So uh, that's it for this edition of Crypto Defined. Uh, please check out truthdow.news in the next few days. We'll have a written recap of our interview with Mike Alfred. You can follow him on Twitter at, at Mike Alfred, A-L-F-R-E-D, and also on LinkedIn. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. Great talking to you. Thank you.